Welcome to episode 122. Are you ready for the adventure of a lifetime? No matter your destination, the travel specialists at 3D Travel Company are there to help. Just head on over to my website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click the Book Now button on the left-hand side to get your free quote today. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest was the voice of Barbie from the late 90s, early 2000s, till about 2015. She was in movies such as Barbie in the Nutcracker, Barbie of Swan Lake, and Barbie as Rapunzel. Here's a clip from Barbie in the Nutcracker. I hope you all enjoy. Oh, my poor Nutcracker. Don't worry, Clara. I'm just wood, remember? You and I know you're much more than that. Prince Eric. Of course. The princess has been with us all along. What? Clara, it's you. You are the Sugar Plum Princess. Me? I couldn't be. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Who Did That Voice? In just a moment, the show will begin. So, so please, please sit, sit back. back Relax and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, I have Kelly Sheridan joining us. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Well, Kelly, the very first thing we love to do when we have a new guest on the show is just to get a background on who our special guest is. So tell me about little Kelly and who was the little <laughs> girl that grew into the beautiful woman she is today? And how did you get into acting? And more specifically, how did you get into voice acting? Well, I do love interviews that start off with flattery, so we're <laughs> off to a great start. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful. <laughs> Little Kelly um, was very precocious. Uh, I've always been a performer, um, much to my parents' chagrin. There was lots of living room performances and lots of singing, <laughs> doing dishes, and lots of like, maybe we don't need the entire Broadway recording of Les Mis while you're cleaning the bathroom today. <laughs> um and so I was very busy. I was very, very busy. And uh, my mom found a small um, community theater for youth in Vancouver when I was about, oh, 13 or so um, with a, a woman named Carol Tarlington who founded the Vancouver Youth Theater. And there's actually a few people in the voiceover community who grew up there. Uh, Richard Cox is, is one that springs to mind. Fantastic. And kind of got their start there. And so I did community theater at the youth theater, and it was really great. It was um, all of the shows were written and performed by youth, by people 18 and under. But it was a very professional environment. We toured internationally, and that's kind of really where I cut my teeth as an actor as a kid. And the woman that ran the theater also ran a talent agency for youth. Um, and so I joined her agency shortly after I joined the theater and she would send me out on auditions for stuff, including voiceover work. So I booked my first gig when I was, I don't know, about 13 years old and haven't, haven't done much of anything else since. I've just been really lucky to be a working actor for most of my life. Absolutely. It is definitely a blessing when you have continual work and especially in the industry of voiceover uh, because it is such a small niche and it's becoming a more known niche, but it's still a small community of people that has a whole work in it, whether it's in the Canadian district or the UK or in the USA. Yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm really lucky. Absolutely. You are one of the elite few that get to be a voiceover <laughs> professional full time, which is super amazing because there's a lot of people that do shows here and there. But to be able to be doing it since you were a kid, that's super fantastic. Yeah, it de definitely gave me an edge. You form a lot of relationships early on, a lot of professional relationships and people, you know, obviously it's based on talent and who's best for the role. But there's an element, too, of people, directors and producers liking to work, liking to work with people who they they've worked with before who they know are going to show up on time and be prepared and work well and all that stuff. So absolutely, it was a definite advantage. 
I totally agree because, you know, that, you know, networking like that is so good because it's not just getting a phone number or an email. It's building a relationship so that they know who Kelly is. And so they can say, I can depend on this Kelly girl. I need her for my show. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Well, Kelly, speaking of shows you've been on, you actually have been a part of my life longer than I have actually known your name. And I I grew up knowing you through Barbie because um, my sisters watched the heck out of those shows (laughs) as a kid. And yeah. um, so Barbie and the Nutcracker, Barbie as Rapunzel and Barbie of Swan Lake are the three movies that I think I watched repetitively throughout my childhood and early teens. I because think we of my recorded sisters. them in that order. I think those were the first <laughs> three we did. I believe they were. But those three yeah. actually, they were very captivating, especially after watching them the 200,000th time. But, <laughs> you know, I, I loved your voice. And how did that role come about for you? How did you get to be Barbie? And you have been Barbie since... Uh, gosh, I can't even remember what year that first one was done. The Nutcracker. The first one was 2001, I believe. Okay. And I played her up until, uh, I think, 2014, 2015, something like that. Yeah, the last one I saw was 2015. So. Yeah, that was that was my last one as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. I mean, over a decade, it's 15 years of playing a pretty iconic role. Absolutely. I was in university at the time. Excuse me. And, you know, I auditioned for stuff regularly because I had an agent at that time. And there was this call that came up for Barbie. And they auditioned uh, people here, I believe in Toronto, um, New York and L.A., I think were the four cities they were auditioning actresses. And I went in for the audition. And, um, oh, actually, at first they didn't want to see me. Oh, wow. My agent really had to fight for them to because the, the casting director wasn't familiar with me. And so my agent to her at the time, to her credit, really, really pushed for them to bring me in, which they did. And I went and auditioned. And then, you know, like any audition as an actor, you develop the skill where you just forget about it as soon as the audition is done. And I was doing a show, a play at the time, and I got a call back for Barbie. And it was on the day of a performance. And I said, I can't go to the callback. I have a show. I can't let down everyone who's bought a ticket and all of my castmates, I can't leave for an audition. Um, and they said, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, I guess you're just going to have to listen to my first audition and count that as my callback. And I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to get it now. There's no way. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, and I guess maybe it's a good thing that I didn't go into the, the, into the callback because I got the, you know, we got the call shortly after saying, yeah, we'd like her to come in and, and, and play the role. Holy cow, what a story. <laughs> yeah, I know. And even that first day of recording, I thought, oh, they're going to send me home. You know what I mean? They they yeah. don't they haven't really put me through my paces. What if I can't actually do this? It's it's it was such a huge deal. Um, you know, they brought they flew Tim Curry up. It was this, you know, they had Andrea Romano, who's a, a brilliant voiceover director, just prolific, you know, directed Animaniacs and a million other things. Yeah. Um, as the voice director and all the producers and clients were there. Anyways, I somehow made it through the first day and they kept calling me back to, to play her in subsequent movies. So I guess it was lucky that I didn't have to go in for the callback. Well, I really admire you for sticking to your guns. And even though you had a callback, you know, you said, I can't let these people down. I'm in a show. Uh, I really admire that. And then for you to still triumph and win the role of Barbie, that's an ultimate win story, which is super fantastic and kind of romantic. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, I think it says something for doing the right thing and doing the ethical thing and, and that that will pay off. I mean, I wasn't expecting the payoff to be, you'll get the role, but, (laughs) uh, and I don't necessarily believe in karma, but I do believe in doing the right thing and, and that that'll pay off. And, and conversely, if you, if you do something for selfish reasons, that comes back and bites you in the butt. Maybe it's 30 years from now that it comes back, but but people remember that um, yeah. and people can't really dispute if you're doing something ethically and from the heart. You know what I mean? It's kind of hard to be upset with someone for that reason. So yeah, absolutely. Anyway, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is so fantastic. So are you still voicing her or has that mantle been passed on or that mantle has been passed on? They've okay. done some rebranding. They're doing different things with Barbie now. And so someone else gets to gets to play her and gets that, you know, magical opportunity. I, I'm surprised I got to play her as long as I did. And, you know, it's, that's a real treat as an actor. You're used to, 
you get a, if you get a one day gig, that's that's a gift. And if you get a series, that's you know a one season series, that's a really nice gift. Yeah. And if you end up playing a character for years and years, that's that rarely happens. So, you know, that's kind of a once in a lifetime career thing. So yeah, I was really happy to play her for as long as I did. Oh, for sure. I mean, Barbie's always been a character that I really gravitated towards. Um, I actually had Chris Anthony Lansdowne on the show uh, as one of my first, I think, 10 or 20 episodes. And she was the voice of Barbie, um, kind of the first established voice, as far as I understand it, uh, of Barbie for a lot of the toys and stuff back in the uh, 90s and everything. So it's really cool to be able to speak generationally to actresses who have continued on the legacy of her character because she is such an iconic character that people know whether they're into Barbie or not they know Barbie you know um yeah and it's just really cool to get to talk with you about that today so I appreciate you diving into it Kelly oh thank you no I like talking about Barbie she's pretty fun <laughs> <laughs> absolutely sweetheart and just good wholesome movies and films for kids and families alike yeah kind clever and brave that's her <laughs> absolutely well you know what the next thing i wanted to talk about we're jumping gears a little bit we're going from shows and movies and animation to a video game called dynasty warriors gundam and uh, you probably know what i'm talking about we have dynasty Ooh. warriors gundam one two and three and your character's name i'm not particularly sure on her pronunciation of the name but i believe it's rue luca Potentially. Oh, yeah, that's a deep cut. That was ages ago. <laughs> well, you <laughs> played in three of those games, and I remember playing the game, but I don't always, you know, remember the characters uh, as to who their names are. I just remember playing and, and saying, oh, that character was really cool. But, uh, you know, being a, being a part of video games like that, the Dynasty Warriors series is amazing. But then when they came out with Dynasty Warriors Gundam, it was really cool because they took a different franchise to the same kind of game format. And what was it like for you getting to be a part of a, a video game franchise like that? Well, to be honest, I didn't really know much about it when I when I did the role, and it was so long ago. Um, but the fun thing about video games is they're a very different, just from a practical, technical side as an actor, they're very different to record yeah. as opposed to a cartoon. Um, you know, with video games, you have all of these parameters and all of these... Um, possibilities for the characters to it's kind of like you know in a way it's a choose your own adventure thing yeah so when you're recording it you have to record all of these different avenues and all these different paths and opportunities for the character um so the scripts are very large they're you know five times as thick as a regular half hour recording episode kind of thing yeah and you end up doing a lot of repetition and a lot of uh, depending on the video game a lot of yelling yeah. There's usually a lot of fighting and a lot of um, intense emotion. So they're they're really challenging and they're quite tiring, but um, but they're quite fun. But it's fun. It's funny. That's one that we the uh, Rue Luca is a, a character that resurfaces every once in a while that people want to uh, talk about and and reminisce over. I was just thought she was super strong. She was. It's cool that she was a pilot. Yeah, um, a female pilot. That's great. pretty badass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really cool. Well, it is super fantastic that you got to play Rue Luca on the Dynasty Warriors Gundam series. And I really kind of appreciate you diving into, um, you know, the differences in the aspects of variation between animation and uh, a video game. And it definitely seems more labor intensive for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, and it's just you in the room. So it's usually. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's all you. So it's not as much of a... Uh, Darn, I'm blanking out on the word. Not as much of a group session type thing, but more of a solo thing. Yeah, it's not as playful. You don't get the kind of back and forth. So, um, I mean, obviously it would take them hours and hours to record a video game if they were going to do it all chronologically with everybody in the room. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of another amazing topic, we're jumping gears back to animation uh, and, and different cartoons. My Little Pony is something that jumps to mind, and it's a show that I've grown up watching off and on throughout my childhood, teens, and adult years uh, for one reason or another. And I've always been fascinated by the show. It was a very unique concept when it first aired back in the 80s. And tell me how you got involved with that series. And you have so many pony names, I couldn't even begin to list them. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just going to let her tell the story. And, and you mentioned maybe some of your highlighted ponies and characters you've played because you've been a part of it looked like multiple series throughout multiple yes. time frames, And I was just like, wow, this is super epic. So tell us about My Little Pony and your involvement with that series and some of the highlighted characters, Kelly. 
Well, there have been a lot of pony incarnations that I've been, you know, um, lucky enough to be a part of. Yeah. And my love affair with My Little Pony started when I was a kid in the <laughs> 80s. Nice. That was one of the fir- uh, one of the first generation ponies before they had cutie marks or names or any of that stuff. There's six of them that were released. The first line of ponies um, was one of the first things I ever bought with my allowance when I was a kid. I was nice. probably, you know, eight years old or something. And man, I love that thing. I think her, <laughs> her name ended up being Clover or Minty or something. She was the green one. I, do, I remember her very vividly. Um, and I had a My Little Pony lunchbox, which I still have. I have a vintage <laughs> 80s My Little Pony lunchbox. I don't even know if kids have lunchboxes anymore, but they I really have one. don't. They get those like little plastic they zip up bags right? and they, they get those I little, uh, they're like little scrunchy, they're like backpacks, but miniature sized, you know? Yeah, like with coolers and, you yeah, know, all that yeah. stuff for your kombucha. People and your, don't know. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the lunchboxes were the coolest back in the day. And the little cooler oh, and everything. The, the coolest. Ther- I'm sorry, the thermos. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. <laughs> the thermos that clicked in into yeah. the, so they were these hard plastic lunchboxes. They were really cool. And they always had, you know, neat cover art. So you'd have like the Star Wars lunchbox, Spider-Man lunchbox. Teenage Mutant Ninja whatever Turtles, your favorite Barbie. Was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. And you always had to, you'd have your like peanut butter sandwich and your apple. And if you're really lucky, some kind of sweet treat in your thermos in there. And then it'll all juice. click in. <laughs> yeah, apple juice. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I mean, I've loved My Little Pony since I was a kid. And I believe my first gig... On My Little Ponies was My Little Pony Tales, which would have been early 90s. Nice. 89, 1990, something like that. And that was my first series. I'd had a few voiceover gigs before that, but just, you know, one-off kind of guest roles of one episode on something here or there. Yeah. So that was my first series. And um, it was really fun. It was, you know, there was like eight women and a lot of them I still work with. A lot of them are still in the business. The majority of them, in fact. Wally Burr directed that, who's um, directed a ton of stuff. G.I. Joe, tons of stuff, yeah. G.I. Joe, I believe he directed Transformers, Conan, he was really known for Conan. Yeah. Um, A bunch of other things. And it was super fun. It was, you know, one of my first gigs. I was about 13 or 14. I felt super cool. I got to take (laughs) off school, you know, one afternoon a week to go and record and uh, we'd sing the songs. They, it's a kind of amazing now what they managed to cram into a four hour session. They record the show and then there's always a song every episode. We'd record the song as well. Um, yeah, so that was the first, so I played Melody on that pony show and she was blue with kind of ready pink hair and she was the musician of the group and had like a, she's kind of a rock star and she had roller skates and <laughs> like a microphone cutie mark. She was super cool. And then there's been a bunch of um, direct-to-DVD and um, small featurettes that I did kind of in the late 90s, early 1000s, I believe. Okay. Um, we did a bunch of those. And I played, I believe I played Cheer Lee and, oh my goodness, there are a ton of roles. I mean, if you can't remember <laughs> the pony names, I certainly can't. Uh, and then the newest incarnation is obviously My Little Pony Friendship, of, Friendship is Magic, which is has been one of my favorites to work on. And I play a bunch of roles in that show, but the, the one that I'm probably most well-known for is Starlight Glimmer. <laughs> Super big character, man. Whew. Yeah, so she came in in season five, and she's been really super fun to play. This a massive character arc. She's still growing and changing, so it's it's pretty fun to uh to play her i'm worried about spoilers but i guess people can pause and fast forward and stuff (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) well how fantastic kelly for you to be able to have uh been a part of a a franchise throughout its lifespan uh there's not a lot of actors and actresses that really get that opportunity you know sometimes they kind of want to go a different direction or you know the casting crew is all different or whatever it may be a lot of times the voices change completely for different shows that are reincarnations uh, or expansions of a series. So it's fantastic that you've been a a part of the legacy of that show. Again, I'm a lucky gal. I'll probably say that a lot over the course of, you know, chatting with you. I I feel very lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had. 
Well, you've definitely been blessed with some awesome chances to uh, opportunities and chances to to continue to voice characters and to uh, keep them going for such a longevity time, which is great because people that listen to those shows and I being one of those people, I am very particular about my voices. And if I hear a voice that's changed from what I'm familiar with, sometimes it's a little upsetting, (laughs) you know? Oh, I agree with you. I was I was like that as a kid. Even I could pick out voices oh that guy plays that on that show and he also plays that's the same voice as that and that yeah so you know I could hear it as a kid yeah Mm. you know and that's kind of where this show came from because you know as a kid I was always asking that question who did that voice and that's where my show name came from um you know just because I was so attentive to that and a lot of kids would be like say what what are you talking about different voice you know they don't uh, some people don't notice that and that's why I created the show to kind of help people pinpoint some of those things that maybe they hadn't thought about before so oh yeah that's cool well if you think about it too so many of us begin watching cartoons most of us when we're children and so those voices and those characters are so entrenched in nostalgia yeah that you feel a really strong ownership to them and when they're changed it can feel like a betrayal but it's also just it's the circle of life man it's just (laughs) kind of how it goes where it's yeah. not realistic necessarily to expect the same actor as I mean maybe a slightly more realistic with voiceover because you're you know you physically could age but your voice could sound the same over the course of 50 years potentially yeah. um but there's different different trends come in and out in terms of performance and different producers look for different things different casting directors and writers look for different things And so I totally get, because I'm the same way, feeling (laughs) a strong attachment to whoever originated a role. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that the next person who comes along can't do something really interesting. I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been a person who originated the role and I've been a person who's, you know, played a, a, a new incarnation of a character. And it's definitely funner and easier to be the person who originated the role (laughs) (laughs) less backlash (laughs) yeah exactly well and i'm sure for you being a voice actress you know you have a different perspective and a different appreciation for being the person stepping into the shoes of someone else who's voiced a role before a character uh to voice that role and you're kind of going oh geez i remember when i was a kid thinking oh this voice is Mm -hmm. different and i'm stepping into this role is going to be a different Mm -hmm. voice you know so i'm sure you kind of think about that I, i mean i think i would if i was in that kind of situation so yeah yep definitely (laughs) well the next thing I wanted to talk about is a more recent show that you are currently airing on which airs on Netflix it's called Dino Trucks and you play a character called Blade tell us a little bit about Dino Trucks and about your character Blade well Dino Trucks is a DreamWorks project and it is uh, it's made for Netflix a Netflix original And the premise of the show is there's this team of, it's exactly what it sounds like, dinosaurs, dinosaur truck hybrids. What? And they're this, yeah, (laughs) surprise, surprise. And they, um, there's, you know, a sort of Tyrannosaurus type um, truck that's sort of their leader. Anyways, they're just, they're all fantastic and they're all buddies and they, they solve problems by teamwork and by building things together, by coming up with sort of innovative ways to, to solve problems by building things. And Blade is a villain that comes in, I believe, at the beginning of season three. can't exactly remember what episode she starts in, but she's a doceratops, they're called. So she's kind of a triceratops type bulldozer truck with like a giant, <laughs> you know, the frail is like the, yeah. the dozer part of the truck. <laughs> nice. And she is a big, bad meanie. I'm, I'm used to playing villains who have some sort of redemption or some kind of, um, you know, turning point where they realize the error of their ways. She is not that character. She is <laughs> bad from the beginning and she sticks with it. She's just a big bully. So she's super fun to play. Villains are always really fun to play. And yeah, she's, uh, it's a great show. It's a beautifully animated show. It's, they take so much time with the writing um, more than any other show, I've, we've done a lot of rewrites and, and they call them pickups where they change things and they come back in after a general recording and have you redo things uh, where they've rewritten whole scenes because they the DreamWorks team really wants to make it work. They want to make the best show possible. So it's really fantastic. It's an awesome show. Uh, I know lots of kids who are really into it. The toys are super fun. It's always fun when you do a show and there's a toy. That's <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, then you're like, look, that's me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's super epic. And I love DreamWorks because they really do put a lot of time and effort into their shows and uh, into the animation and into the script writing. And they just really care about their content. They don't just pump stuff out to pump it out because they really do invest time in it. And it, it definitely comes through. Even in a show that's more geared towards younger audiences, it's evident that they've spent enough time on it that it's going to leave a lasting impact on whoever watches it. Well, and if you think about it, that's um, a better position to be in than to put something together slapdash just because it's sort of cheaper and faster to yeah. do. Because um, then you risk are... you risk the chance of losing your audience long term. Yeah. Cartoons, they call them evergreen. The ones that are really good stick around for generations. So if you make something that's really great and timeless, um, that's going to pay off if you spend all the you know time and effort doing it. No, I couldn't agree more with you, Kelly. Absolutely. Because there are shows that I watch now that when I have kids, I will absolutely show them. And then there are others that I was like, mm, nope, <laughs> you know, and it just depends right, yeah. on how the shows were yeah. done and how they impacted my life, you know, but uh, I I'd never heard that before about how some shows are evergreen, but that's a great term. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a common, common thing, common term we use when we talk about cartoons because they do, they last forever. <laughs> that is true. That is most epic. And especially with Netflix and Hulu and all these crazy mm -hmm. new services we have now, shows last in a way that they never could before. Because, you know, if you missed a show back in the day, it was like, oh, well, I guess I'll catch it in a couple of years or something if it comes back on. You know, and now yeah. you can just stream it all and play from episode one all the way to whatever. So. It, uh, and Netflix it's is now changed. showing stuff that I watched as a kid. You know, Mystery <laughs> yeah. Science Theater just came on Netflix recently. No way. Like, oh, no way. I remember watching that. <laughs> I watched so, all of the Goosebumps. I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's fantastic. Cool. Well, Kelly, the next thing I wanted to ask you is what kind of advice would you give to somebody who maybe gravitated towards your characters that we've talked about today, especially Barbie, perhaps, um, or maybe Dino Trucks with your character of Blade? What would you tell a young aspiring actress or actor, um, you know, who's maybe pursuing acting and looking at trying to get into voice acting? What kind of advice would you give them, Kelly? Well, I get asked this question a lot, so I've kind of worked it down into bullet points. And the first major bullet point is you have to live in a city where voiceovers are recorded. Okay. Um, technology, unfortunately, hasn't advanced to the point yet where you can live, you know, in a rural area and do voiceover work. You have to live in the city where the auditions are happening, where the agent, where the agents are, where the producers are, and where it's all going down. And so in the States, that's L.A. and New York and um, a couple of smaller cities in Texas. And in Canada, it's Toronto and Vancouver, and to a smaller extent, Montreal. And that's it. So you have to live in one of those places. And you, I, I strongly recommend people to get some sort of theater or improv or singing training, some kind of performance training, because voiceover is very similar to those big, broad, performative styles in that it's, you know, on, on film and TV and TV and film is very subtle and small performance wise, because your face is ginormous on a screen. You only yeah. need to move an eyelash to be able to convey something with voiceover. You just have your voice. And oftentimes you're playing cartoons who are larger than life. So you, if you have experience and training in, in building characters that are really, that are believable and yet really broad and big, that's handy. And also that kind of performance training is good in terms of learning how to take direction because the voice people often, when they get into voice acting, focus on the voice part. Oh, I can do all these different voices and all these different accents. People say I'm really funny and I do funny voices. Okay. That's awesome. Can you take direction? If I tell you to go a different way with it or want you to do a very specific reading, do you have a musical ear? Can you repeat something back? All of that stuff is training. Um, and that's what's actually hard to cast. Lots of people have very interesting voices, but they can't perform. They can't act. They can't perform under pressure and they can't take direction. Yeah. So training in those areas is really, really handy. Um, and then something you can do without, you know, a lot of high school students want to get in voiceover work, but they live in Indiana and they're, I can't move to LA yet. I'm only 15. <laughs> um, yeah. so do high school theater, um, practice performing and, Practice reading out loud. It's something not a lot of people do. And it's very different to read something in your head, think, oh, I could read this script. Reading out loud is sort of a skill you develop that's really handy, uh, particularly because oftentimes as an actor, I'm sight reading something. If I go into an audition, oftentimes I haven't seen the script ahead of time. They hand it to me and I have 30 seconds to look at it and I have to run in and make a choice. 
so you develop, I've developed this technique or skill where I'm almost reading four or five words ahead of what I'm saying. And that's just something you kind of have to practice to be able to do. Um, and then you have to practice doing it, being able to perform it and being able to put some kind of emotion or, you know, something into it. So those are the three big things. Um, obviously there's a million other things, but training and location and technique practice, practice reading. Those are, you know, and everything else you kind of figure out along the way. It's one of those jobs where you learn the most by just doing it, by experiencing it. Very hands-on kind of a job. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for diving into your advice and your points on uh, different things people should look at and consider. Because, you know, there are probably a lot of kids that listen to this show uh, and they aren't the right age to move out to L.A. or New York or whatever yet. But, uh, you know, like you gave them some great pointers and ideas of how they can pursue it now. And then as they grow, uh, continue to pursue their their dreams. Uh, so thank you very much, Kelly. No, no problem. So Kelly, how can people reach out to you through social media or do you have a website or what's the best way for people to reach out if they have questions or maybe they're inquiring about hiring you for a voiceover project? Uh, I have a website. It's kellysheridan.ca and my agent's contact info is on that website. So he's the person to ask if, you know, for people who are potentially wanting to invite me to a convention or what have you. Um, and then I'm most active on Twitter which my Twitter handle is K Sheridan voice. I'm sure if you just Google Kelly Sheridan voice actor or something, it'll, it'll pop up. Uh, and I am on Facebook as well. I have a Facebook fan page, um, that I don't check as often. Twitter seems to be where most of my, most of my fans are and where I'm, I'm contacted the most. So that's, and I try to read every tweet that's sent and people send really great fan art and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I'm all over that social media stuff. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you for sharing that because uh, a lot of times people are on the show and I know there are people that will be listening like, oh, gosh, how do I reach out to him? Well, hey, guess what? We just told you how. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Kelly, the last question I have for you today is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Oof. Wow. I think um, most of us are just here for a second and then and then we're we're, we're quickly forgotten. We vanish into e into the ether. That's sort of just human nature. You think of all the humans that have existed, and there's only really a few that we remember after hundreds of years, you know, Shakespeare and Plato and Cleopatra and all that stuff. Um, so I think, if anything, it would be to... It's more of a motto, I suppose. There's always more you can do for people. There's always more kindness you can show. There's always more generosity you can show. And that doesn't have to be a grand sweeping gesture. It can be small things that you do for people, particularly for people you don't even know. Uh, I think that's really, at the end of the day, what's going to save us as a, as a species is helping our fellow man. And so if that's something that I can inspire in others and, and get them to inspire in others and so, so on and so forth. Maybe that's, so the, the little glimmer of me that, that's still here hundreds of years later after I've, you know, turned into dust. Wow. That got really deep. <laughs> I got really deep and romantic, but. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I really appreciate you diving into it, you know, and I love to ask that question beyond any of the other questions I ask. I don't ever like to give anyone a heads up on it because I like to get the raw and genuine thoughts on that question. And, uh, you know, it always, it is always a very unique experience for me and for my listeners, I'm sure, um, when that question is asked. Um, you know, I think it's great to know what a person's legacy is, um, whether they know what it is or not. Sometimes it definitely gets you thinking. I know that much for sure. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have children and I don't plan on having them. And, you know, my work is a legacy to a certain extent, but even that isn't going to last forever. Yeah. Um, and so I think our, our actions have a resonance. And if you can inspire people to be good to each other, it's very easy to be good to people and be kind to people you love, but it's harder to be, it's harder to do that to strangers and to people you don't know and to people you don't agree with. Um, I think if we had more of that in the world, we'd be much better off than we are. So I totally agree with you. <laughs> There's <laughs> so much we could dive into with that, but this is not that type of podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> But anyway, Kelly, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, ditto. It's It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Well, Kelly, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Would you please give us a closeout today as Barbie? 
<laughs> sure. This has been Barbie with your imagination station where you can be anything you imagine. This has been Kelly Sheridan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's episode with Kelly Sheridan, the voice of Barbie, and so much more. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice? And don't forget to like, comment, and share. For those of you listening on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button today and hit the little bell notification button so you don't miss out on a single episode. I've been your host, Trenton Larkin, and I'll see you next time. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us next time for our special guest... Chris Edgerly, the voice of Scuttle from the Little Mermaid ride at Disney World, and the voice of Timothy Mouse from the Disneyland Dumbo ride. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they've voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.